Welcome to this very important lecture on heat sink selection. After this lecture, students will hopefully be able to understand how a heat sink works, what is the underlying principle of a heat sink, and what is the main selection criterion. Well, the purpose of the heat sink is to maintain the temperature at a level below the specified maximum operating temperature of the electronic device it is going to cool. There are many electronic devices like transistors, processors, amplifiers, resistors that can get very hot even if they are dissipating a single watt of power. If we allow these devices to dissipate heat without heat sink, then junction to ambient thermal resistance can be as high as 65 degrees centigrade per watt. This means that for every watt of heat loss, the junction temperature of these devices can rise by 65 degree above the ambient temperature. Manufacturers normally mention this value in the data sheet in the form of junction to ambient thermal resistance or RJA. To lower the junction temperature and spread the heat out, heat sinks are used. What is the principle of a heat sink? To understand this point, let's go back to the water tank analogy that was mentioned in the thermal resistance lecture. Just to quickly re recap, we noted earlier that the water tank represented an electronic device and the level of water in the water tank represented the temperature. We also assumed that the amount of water in the water tank represented the heat and there was a drain pipe connected to the bottom of the tank. The flow of water through the pipe represented the heat flow. The clogging in the pipe represented the thermal resistance. Now, you can further imagine that our water tank is being fed from another source at the top. So it's being fed at the top from another source. And this water that is being fed to it is the heat generation. Let's assume that there's a mark on our water tank which denotes the maximum operating temperature and our challenge is that we don't have to allow the water to go above this mark. Now think about it. If water is running out from the tank from the drain pipe at a lower speed than the rate at which the tank is being fed then we can absolutely be certain that water is going to cross the mark. It's only a matter of time. The clogging is there, partially blocking the drain, slowing down the water flow. We cannot sometimes remove the clogging material. This is because in electronics, it may be an internal property of the material that the electronic component is made of. So what can we do instead? Well, what we can do is we can expand the diameter of the drain pipe at the bottom. And this is exactly what happens when you attach a heat sink to an electronic device. Just as the enlarged diameter pipe would allow water to flow out at a faster rate, despite the resistance or clogging still being there, the heat sink does the same thing. If you look at any electronic device and try to work out the area on that device that is uh, in contact with air, then you'll find that that area is very small. Now look at the heat sink and look at how much surface area of the heat sink is in contact with air. Surely it's several times more. Sometimes the area in contact with the air on a heat sink is more than 100 times the area on the electronic device. Heat, we have to remember, is ultimately passed on to the surrounding air. So the greater the contact area with the air, the more heat will flow to it. So this is how a heat sink works by enlarging the contact area with the air. Now the cost, space and power should be the additional criteria that impact the selection of heat sink in addition to performance. Depending upon the requirements, heat sinks are sometimes installed without fans and sometimes with fans. When installed without fans, they make use of natural convection for heat removal.
when installed with fans, the heatsink effectiveness increases significantly. However, the cost also goes up. Fan-based heatsink utilizes for forced convection for heat removal. These fans can often be heard in laptops and PCs. They basically force air over the hot surface. We have to remember that moving air is very effective in removing the heat as compared to static air. In natural convection, the air current is created by buoyancy forces, or in other words, as the air picks up heat, it rises and cold air takes its place. And this makes a loop, an air current. To make natural convection heat sinks more effective, one should ensure that fins are parallel to the direction of gravitational force, just as shown in the figure. Now, there could be two different configurations in which fins are vertical. The best vertical fin uh, configuration is to install the heat sink such that the fins act as vertical air channels. That is, air goes in the bottom and comes out hot from the top. If we install it the other way, then you can see that the base of the heat sink would cause an impedance and it wouldn't allow the air to come through the bottom and rise to the top. Another thing is that if space is an issue, then to remove a certain amount of heat, we would require a larger heat sink that uses free convection or natural convection but we can remove the same amount of heat with a much smaller heat sink with fan. That is, if, you're, if we are using forced convection, we can have a much smaller heat sink compared to um, a much larger heat sink that would be required if we were to dissipate the same amount of heat. The average performance of a typical heat sink is linearly proportional to the width of the heat sink in the direction perpendicular to the heat flow and approximately proportional to the square root of the fin length in the direction parallel to the flow. Now this is something complex that I have said, so what I'll do is I'll break it down. So if we increase the width of the heat sink by a factor of two, the heat dissipation capability also increases by a factor of two. Whereas if we double the length of the fin, then the heat dissipation capability doesn't double. It only increases by a factor of 1.4. Therefore, the priority number one should be to select a heat sink for the allowable width, maximum allowable width, rather than the maximum allowable fin height. Because space is a restriction in most cases, so what you should, you should endeavor to do is to increase the width of the heat sink rather than the height. The effect of radiation is also very important when using only natural convection. As in case of just pure natural convection heat sinks, uh, radiation can be responsible for up to 25% of the total heat dissipation. Unless the electronic component to be cooled is facing a hotter surface nearby, it is important to have the heat sink surfaces painted or anodized to enhance the radiation. Therefore, when designing electronics, critical or high heat dissipation components should not face each other. Neither they should be crowded by other components. This should prevent the radiation from the hot component to exchange heat with other components on the circuit board. So just to recap, the purpose of the heat sink is to lower the junction temperature. Heat sinks work with both natural and forced convection. Forced convection is more effective. Smaller heat sinks with fan can provide the same amount of heat removal as compared to larger heat sinks that use only natural convection. So if using free convection, make sure that the fins have a proper vertical configuration and wider heat sinks are better than taller heat sinks. If possible, electrical components should not surround the heat sinks. So these were the major points.
and this completes the lecture on selecting heatsink. There was a lot of information packed in this lecture, so please take time to absorb it. At this point, I would urge you to explore different heat sinks available on websites like Amazon and eBay. In the next lecture, we will look at the thermal resistance of heat sink. Thank you for your attention.